Hi, I'm Scott Hoffman. Welcome to Along Those Lines, a podcast about electric cooperatives, the work they do, and the challenges they face. In this episode, we're going to be talking about what's known as the evolving grid. We have three experts who will help us understand this complex issue and how it will one day impact how all of us consume electricity. First up, we're going to talk to Jim Spires. He's the Senior Vice President for Business and Technology Strategies at NRECA. He's going to give us a high-level perspective on what we're talking about with this evolving grid. And later, we're going to talk to two electric cooperative leaders, one from North Carolina and one from Vermont, about what they're seeing on the ground in their states. Jim, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Hey, Scott. Uh, delighted to join you. Okay, so let's, let's start by talking about where the electric grid has come from. What's the normal? Where have we been over the last 85 years? Just to kind of level set on where we are and where we're going. Well, it all goes back to Edison and Tesla and Westinghouse, uh, alternating current versus direct current. Uh, We ended up with uh, the development of uh, large generation stations and the ability to transport power over long distances to really have a grid that was very, very central station driven. And then it transported and transformed through a series of steps down to the distribution level and then was to provide the basic electric service to distribution entities that connected to the consumer. Right. Now, that was the general model. Right. And so that's kind of a more of a top-down model. It moves pretty much in one direction. What's different now? Why are we calling this an evolving grid? Now we're seeing it more of a network model. What you have is you have distributed generation resources. So if you think about it, solar solar rooftop or community solar. So you have sources of electricity or electric service that are coming in at the distribution level, not at the central station. So what that now does is instead of the one-way flow of electrons and the one-way flow of data and the reverse flow of money, Mm -hmm. you now have two-way flows of electrons. You have two-way flows of information and you have two-way flows of money. So it's a fundamentally different model and the the hierarchical central station model. And it's evolving at different paces around the country. Some areas are evolving very quickly, the higher density areas a little bit more quickly. But even in rural America, we're seeing pretty significant transformation of the grid. Are we able to kind of pinpoint a point in time or a technology development that sort of took us from where we were to where we're going? Well, I think the biggest driver of the whole decentralization and what we now call distributed energy resources model, there were bits and pieces and pockets of it around the country. But the real key driver was uh, the development and the cost effectiveness of solar. As solar became cost effective, we started with rooftop solar, then we went to utility scale solar, and for a lot of cooperatives, the community solar, where the utility would be, the cooperative would be involved in developing it, but then the member consumers could participate in that community Mm -hmm. array. So solar has had the most significant single technology shift in the landscape as we speak. And talk a little bit about the fact that you say it's going from one way to a two-way kind of communication. There's technology that's developed over the last 10, 15 years that has allowed that actual flow of, of information. What's going on there? What were some of the developments in that area? If you go back to the mid-2000s, we're really starting to see an impetus with new technologies, uh, so-called smart meters, the advanced metering infrastructure, AMI, if you will. A lot of people talk about AMI, that smart meter that could actually do more and date more data collection about how the grid was being used than that two-way flow of, of data and then ultimately the two-way flow of money that's associated with uh, how the electrons flow. So that architecture and then control architecture and software. So in this last decade, we've seen the development of the electric industry, much as we saw the telecom industry almost exactly 30 years ago when we moved from an analog switch to a digital switch. We went into a totally different industry in telecommunications than what we had 30 years ago. And we're in that same digitization, that digital shift of where it's really more about software control and outcomes than it is about the asset. It used to be about the asset, big power plant, transmission lines, distribution lines, and the like. Now it's really more about outcomes that are software and technology driven. And as far as the consumer goes, what are they getting out of this evolving grid? Well, the thing that is interesting about any technology, and of course we're facing it in the electric industry with this whole world of distributed energy resources, any technology, it's all driven by consumer demand and consumer expectations and what the consumer finds of value. 
quality of life, economic prosperity, environmental gain, whatever, however you want to think about it. But think about how we use a, a so-called smartphone today versus how we used that landline phone 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Today, kids don't even use the smartphone for phone calls. They use it for all sorts of other stuff. It's not even really a phone. Right. It's a different way of controlling their life. And so what are those elements that we're going to see as they kind of continue to propagate into uh, the electric space. Mm -hmm. How are electric cooperatives particularly well positioned to not only plug into this trend, but lead it? Well, it goes back to the consumer. For cooperatives, we're beholden to the member consumers. Now, you've got to cover costs, you've got to have margin for contingencies, but at the end of the day, if you have money that you don't need in the system, that's returned to those consumer members uh, through the, the cooperative model. So we've always had the consumer member first. And then what that does, that says that you don't want to overbuild or you don't want to take unnecessary risk for those consumers, but you can also be pretty innovative. So I think it's cooperatives have this innovation model that they can move very, very quickly, but it's also because it's put through a prism of what's of value to the consumer. How do we deliver fundamental value to the consumer members of that cooperative? We used to go from that one meter read a month per meter to now literally on that meter, you can get five second reads. And that data, what do you do with that data? How do you take that data? How do you convert it to knowledge? How do you convert it to decision support is really a key issue. Where do you see this going 15, 20, 50 years from now? <laughs> is there going to be a grid? Are there going to be co-ops? Is everyone going to produce their own power? Where, where's this going? I don't think we know with any precision by any stretch what's going to happen beyond five, beyond 10 years. But there's some basics that we know that we have to do today. New control systems, new software systems, new cybersecurity protocols and protections uh, built in. So there are core things that we're going to need no matter what shape the grid evolves to in that 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 year uh, mm -hmm. window. So no crystal ball yeah. by any stretch, but you can make really smart decisions, even in the face of ambiguity, as long as you're putting some of those views of the future out there and testing your investments against those. Sometimes we're going to have investments that we're going to have to walk away from, but we want to do that being as mindful as we can. Jim, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Hey, thanks, Scott. Appreciate it. Patty Richards is CEO of Washington Electric Cooperative in Vermont. They have been pioneers in integrating renewables, including their members' rooftop solar, and they've been very progressive in responding to the desires of their members to not only interact with the co-op, but also with the grid. Patty, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to do this. What we're looking for from you, Patty, is kind of that front lines view. What's going on on the ground at distribution co-ops as this mm -hmm. as this grid is, is changing so quickly? What exactly is the evolving grid? You know, that's an interesting question or an interesting term to call what we're doing now in the electric industry. In Vermont, for me, first and foremost, that means reliability. Mm -hmm. No matter what we do in terms of providing electricity, we got to make sure first the electrons get to the members and get to our consumers. And first and foremost is obviously the whole reliability aspect. And then when I think about that, what I'm really looking at is we've had some nasty storms here in the Northeast. We've had week-long power outages from really intense both winter storms, summer storms, and it seems like we're having the 100-year storm every year now. Mm -hmm. So the whole reliability aspect is we have to get more creative in terms of how we deliver the electricity to the rural communities because having power up for a week is just people can't last that long. It's no water. You can't function in terms of getting your work done. You know, your basic needs are not being met. So a lot of people think evolving grid. They're thinking solar. They're thinking, you know, no features, new innovation. I get right down to the basics. And in terms of evolving grid, I'm looking at doing more microgrids mm -hmm. where we have a whole lot more redundancy in the rural communities that we serve. One of the things that we're exploring is to do a utility scaled battery. So we're looking at exploring a whole lot more in that space. So for you, essentially the evolving grid means new ways to improve service to your members. Yep, you got it. We've got a tremendous amount of solar penetration here in our service territory in, in Vermont. We have a lot of open space. The state has really lucrative rates to pay for solar. So we've seen an explosion of net metering, which is great because that means we've got more distributed generation on our grid. But with that comes challenges that, you know, hey, consumers are like, you know, hey, I just put up a $20,000 solar panel and I can't stay on unless you're on. 
in terms of the electric utility. So we have the symbiotic relationship. We really need to be sure that we've got grid stability. We have reliability in terms of these power outages. And the more that people are tapping into our electric system, the more reliable we're going to have to be. You know, we also are looking at the electric vehicle base as consumers really start embracing electric vehicles as the technology in the EV space gets better. We're going to see more and more people depend on the electric co-op for their transportation needs. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, you suddenly become the way people get around. Yeah, exactly. Not only, you know, the basic fundamental needs of the house, but it's also how they get away from the house. If our grid's not up, they're not going to be able to power their car. You think about the electric utility, fast forward 100 years, what is the consumer going to be needing their electric utility for? And to me, that's what I'm aiming for. And I, I see us as the electrification of how people run their lives is going to increase, not decrease. So back to the solar penetration, can you point to something in the recent history where you said, okay, that's where we transitioned from the standard one-way grid to this new kind of frontier? Certainly in the co-op space, you know, we're really here just to meet our members' needs. So our frontier and our forward thinking and innovation is really driven, every decade it's driven by what our consumers are asking for us at that time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, right now solar is the big, you know, everyone's really focused on solar, but there's a whole lot more going on just in terms of the day-to-day aspect. Like I said, people are looking for time of use rate. If they have a Tesla power wall that they want to put in their house and they can say, hey, I can run my power wall all day long and then I'll discharge my battery, my Tesla Powerwall, and then during the night hours, I'll use the grid and charge back up my battery. But from the utility, they're looking for a time of use rate for that. Mm -hmm. People are getting more creative in terms of the stuff that they're doing and managing their own electricity use. The whole idea of resiliency in this space, where do you see that going? Are we headed for everyone is on a microgrid? Is that going to be the solution, or do you see it going in a different direction? Fast forward 100 years, I would love to see tiny little islands, you know, think about loop systems that can withstand power outages on their own. So if we've got small islands, I'm just going to make up a number, say 10-mile circumference. If you could have reliability in that 10-mile area and not worry what's going on upstream from that area, then we could guarantee almost 100% reliability during the course of the year. The whole concept of getting away from a long-standing power outage, I think it's someplace we have to go. And how are you hearing from your members on this? Is it from the storms and they're saying, what are you guys going to do about this? Certainly the storms are, first and foremost, the catalyst behind people complaining to us. Mm-hmm. They just People can't tolerate anymore a multiple-day outage. Right. It, the way we live in today's society... That's just not okay. 50 years ago, if the power went out for a long time, it wasn't such a big deal because we didn't depend so much fundamentally on electricity. Now you've got computers. Many people work from home. That would mean, you know, hey, I can't work today. I have no electricity. It's just become that much more critical that people have constant service in a short amount of time. You've got medical needs. There's a more significant emphasis on electricity today than it was 50 years ago. Right. Do you consider the net metering aspect part of this evolving grid, part and parcel of it? Oh, it's absolutely part of the evolving grid. And again, that's what our members want to do. They want to put up solar panels and run electricity for their house. So I totally get that. That's definitely, for Washington Electric Co-op, we have almost 25% of our peak, a quarter of our peak is served by members having their own solar panels at their homes and Mm -hmm. businesses. Yeah, that's big. It's the nature of what we do. And as consumers, like I said, as they get more sophisticated, as every member, every customer gets more sophisticated in what they want from their electric utility, we too have to evolve and innovate. You know, we're going to have to be coming up with new ways to move power around, quicker and more resilient grids. That's our future. You know, I think about it as any industry has to continue to innovate. If we do the same thing day in and day out, you don't survive as an industry. So I see it that, you know, the situation we're in now, we'll definitely evolve and continue to innovate, but I never see us in a plateau position, so to speak, where we stop growing and stop having to come up with new ways of doing things. The utility space is going to have to constantly innovate. Patty, thanks so much for being on the program. It's great stuff. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking with you.
Lee Ragsdale is Senior Vice President for Grid Infrastructure and Compliance at North Carolina EMC. That's the power provider for electric cooperatives in North Carolina, and they've been working for the last several years with their member cooperatives on some really innovative things with microgrids and kind of pushing the boundaries of the capabilities of their grid. Lee, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for being here. Oh, my pleasure. What exactly does this evolving grid mean to you? This evolution is changing what's possible for electric cooperatives and for our members. So there's new opportunities to optimize the system, to optimize the grid, and to implement technologies that give more control to both the co-ops and to our members, allowing us to move towards a lower carbon future and a more resilient grid with all the distributed energy resources being located throughout our systems. The transition will be driven by data and required devices to communicate with each other, and all that will be dependent upon broadband access, which is really, really important. It's part of what makes broadband so critical for cooperatives and the members and communities that they serve. But you've seen other advances in technology, both in scope as well as in cost and skill, coupled with consumers who are expecting more convenience and control. That's changing how we interact with our systems and with our members. So we see the cost of solar is coming down. We see the cost of batteries are coming down. How these components can interact on the grid is helping to evolve that grid. What are you seeing in North Carolina on how co-ops are not just benefiting from this trend, but actually leading it out? So we've been working on a couple of microgrid projects in North Carolina that I think are an excellent opportunity to see how the grid is evolving and where we can work with these new technologies and find ways to better optimize them. The first microgrid was Ocracoke. We developed in partnership with with Tideland EMC, which is the local cooperative in the Outer Banks. And Ocracoke Island is located on a transmission line in a remote area. It's exposed to harsh weather conditions, severe storms, hurricanes, nor'easters, etc. And we were able to integrate components like battery storage and solar panels and demand-side components like smart thermostats and water heater controls to provide resilience and reliability and to serve as a resource that is local that can be called on during peak demand to help reduce overall costs. So that's an example of multiple value streams, multiple opportunities from a set of resources. The components are known, but bringing together that controller that integrates those components together produces value and helps us to optimize the grid. Yeah, and I think that's probably the most In terms of our audience, that's probably the kind of thing we can point to and say, if you want to know what the evolving grid is, look at what's going on on Ocracoke. You're still tweaking the system. You're still playing around with the configuration. What kind of things are you learning from Ocracoke? So it is a research facility for us, and and we've been able to test some use cases and understand how batteries and solar can work together. We're looking at ways to pay for the system through the value of demand response, both in the markets that we serve out there, as well as just responding to to resiliency events. There was a time uh, when there was an outage on the island, and before we brought uh, power back to the island, we were able to control the thermostats and water heaters so that when the power was turned back on, every air conditioner and every water heater did not immediately turn back on. That reduced the cold load pickup, which is a significant shock on a system when you're returning the power to be back on. Mm -hmm. That demand response functionality of the microgrid allowed for us to have a smooth and stable transition back from the power being out to the power being on. And that's another example of of the thing we've learned with this microgrid that we're able to apply in other places. We have another microgrid at Butler Farms that we worked on with South River EMC. And Butler Farms is a, a hog farm. Tom Butler has has hog houses and he, he grows hogs uh, in, in North Carolina. And he invested in a biogas system. He invested in solar on his farm. We came in and added in a battery storage capability and a microgrid controller. And now not only is he getting some resiliency, but we're actually able to add resiliency to the neighborhood. So South River can actually sectionalize the power lines off of the farm and allow for the battery storage that NCEMC owns to supply energy locally to more than just Mr. Butler, but to right now to 28 homes in the area. And so there we have a microgrid with member-owned components and interaction with the distribution co-op to serve the local community. Is the grid going to continue to evolve for our lifetimes, or do you see this kind of coming toward a single focal point? You know, I think we're in the early stages of this evolution. We've seen a tremendous change in technology and costs and and how those technologies are integrated on the grid will really be um, the important thing to think about through this evolution. But, you know, it's important to remember that our system was built over 100 years 
and we have to be very strategic about the improvements that we make to ensure that we continue to preserve service and reliability as we seek to achieve optimization. We want to make sure that we do the things right. But in the end, the end product is going to be a grid that delivers power when it's needed, where it's needed. We need a system that's more responsive with distributed energy and lower carbon energy resources available. Uh, and that technology gives us more control over those resources to help serve the members. We know it's a huge engineering marvel what we've got for this grid, and you can't just replace it. You have to be very thoughtful about it and, again, strategic about it so that we can maintain all the different pieces of infrastructure that go all the way from the power source, the generation, through to the light switch at the end of the line. I don't see an end point. I see a, a constant transition. So, Lee, I know one thing you've been working really closely with is this concept of a distribution system operator, uh, which you see as kind of an important structure to support the grid as it's changing. There's been a lot of talk about the idea of a distribution operator. And the distribution operator is responsible for maintaining reliability and safety and stability on the distribution system. But with the growth of distributed energy resources, with the growth of microgrids, with the growth of other resources at the edge of the grid, it's really important to develop the capability to aggregate and manage those resources so that we continue to deliver affordable, reliable power to our members. And it's that interaction between the distribution operator and the resources at the edge of the grid that is key. And so we've been doing these microgrid projects. We've been working with thermostats and other devices at the edge so that we can understand how they function. So you see kind of a role for not only co-ops, but their GNTs as well as the manager of all these different inputs to the grid to make sure that it stays as an orderly process where we're maintaining control over the grid with all of these different inputs coming in. Absolutely. I mean, that's the role that the EMCs have been providing for years, and it's continuing to manage and provide that stable, reliable, affordable power to our members. And who better to be positioned to provide that than the distribution operator who has the distribution system and has that obligation? We feel like it's a perfect role for distribution co-ops as well as the G&Ts that work with them on their power supply and helping them to manage their costs. We appreciate you being on, Lee, and, and you guys are doing doing amazing work. I, we'll get you back on again sometime because I, I think we're going to hit this subject again. Great. Okay. Thank you. I look forward to it. Thanks to all my guests and to you, our listeners. Be sure to download and subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast app. For more information on this and many other topics, visit electric.coop. Until next time, for Along Those Lines, I'm Scott Hoffman. Mm-hmm.